Jeffrey Kay of KCET Los Angeles begins our report on Mars and the space program. Yes, Sam, I'm sorry to report that all we have is HKTM at this point. It seemed to have been a nominal no-contact MR pass. Although NASA engineers have yeah, not completely given up is. hope, more than likely the missions of the Mars Polar Lander and its companion probes have ended in failure. Early this morning, after the seventh failed attempt to contact the lander, project manager Richard Cook expressed the team's frustration. Uh, the fact that the mission is not a success, or apparently appears to not be a success, um, is extremely frustrating to both me and to the team and to the entire uh, institution. I mean, it's, it's just not something that we accept, uh, and we're going we're gonna to go about trying to, to do better the next time. The latest setbacks follow the September 23rd loss of the Mars Climate Orbiter. In all, the cost of the orbiter, the lander, and the probes was $356.8 million, plus the years of work by hundreds of scientists and engineers. So over the past days, as project engineers sought answers to technical issues, there have also been questions about management and policy. NASA's philosophy of better, faster, cheaper has meant more missions at a lower cost instead of a few billion-dollar projects. But critics question whether the policy carries too much risk. The faster, cheaper, better policy um, seems to be breaking down somewhat. You, you've now had two failed missions, presumably, um, at a cost of roughly $300 million, uh, which is certainly not cheap. Uh, it's not fast, and uh, it's not better. Whenever we're doing this business, um, you have to risk something to get something. And the, the, the faster, better, cheaper allows us to do a lot of things um, that we might not or ordinarily have the chance to do. We have a lot more missions, a lot more fr frequently, um, and I think that, that, uh, that that's a benefit. A recent NASA audit of the management of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory pointed to problems in the lab's implementation of NASA's better, faster, cheaper philosophy. NASA's successes, notably the Mars Pathfinder mission, have been dramatic, but so have the failures. After the loss of the orbiter two and a half months ago, a NASA investigation board confirmed it had failed because engineers at Lockheed Martin Astronautics in Colorado, the company that designed and built the orbiter and lander, provided data in pounds and feet to navigators at the JPL. They thought the numbers they were getting were metric measurements. The NASA investigation suggested that error was the tip of an iceberg. It found evidence of inadequate communications between project personnel, less than adequate staffing of the navigation team, inadequate training and testing, and poor attention to navigation risk management. The report into the orbiter loss followed a separate critical audit, one issued in September by the NASA Inspector General. The audit also examined the relationship between JPL and Lockheed Martin, as well as other JPL subcontractors. It found that JPL had not adequately managed and supervised Lockheed, and that Lockheed had not properly staffed the orbiter or lander projects. As a result, the audit said there had been poor workmanship, ineffective engineering designs, and hardware that was not built to specifications. The reports prompted the engineering teams to review their calculations for the Mars Polar Lander and to add more staff. Engineers also responded to investigators' concerns about potential landing problems by making 11th hour adjustments in a technique never attempted before, one in which 12 rocket thrusters were supposed to fire in perfect unison. At this point, engineers don't know whether the lander's silence is a result of a preventable technical failure or of bad luck and the difficulty of landing on an unknown surface, perhaps sandy, maybe rocky, 157 million miles from Earth. Future space missions now under construction by teams from JPL and Lockheed Martin are likely to come under further scrutiny as a result of the orbiter and lander failures. And Gwen Eiffel has more. For more on the fallout from the latest failed mission to Mars, we're joined by Lori Garver, NASA's Associate Administrator for Policy and Plans, John Logsdon, Director of the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University, and Liam Sarsfield, a Senior Fellow at the Rand Silence 
Science and Technology Policy Institute. Ms. Garver, what does the apparent failure of this latest mission mean for the future of Mars exploration? I think uh, humanity is a species that is destined to explore and that we will continue to explore Mars. NASA is committed to investigating these two spacecraft mishaps to find out all we can to incorporate lessons learned into future exploration efforts. Right now you've heard and you saw in that opening piece by Jeff Kay the, the criticism of the faster, better, cheaper method of, of, of mounting missions. Could you explain to us what that is and how it came to be part of policy? Faster, better, cheaper is a philosophy really that dates back to the early 1990s in the Bush and Quayle administration. Uh, we have been having missions for the last 10 years, more like 10 a year rather than one every 10 years. Uh, the large spacecraft, we call them Battlestar Galacticas, used to be a billion dollar missions minimum, sometimes a couple of billion dollars, and would take people their entire careers through development and in fact we might uh, have even lost them like we did in the case of Mars Observer. So if you look at had we continued under that philosophy, we would have not even had another mission since the loss of Mars Observer, where in fact we've had two successful Mars missions. We would have lost a whole billion dollars instead of several hundreds of millions. Nevertheless, we're taking this extremely seriously and I think we'll look to set up an infrastructure on Mars perhaps rather than um, just the smaller um, missions every couple years. Mr. Logston, what lessons can be taken, if any at all, from this kind of a failure? Well, I think the uh, lesson may be that we can try to do things too cheaply. Uh, the, the basic philosophy of doing things faster and, and better, of course, is, is not flawed, but uh, maybe not quite so cheaply. There are things that could have been on this mission that weren't that at a minimum could tell us what happened. Uh, so I, I think it's getting the balance between risk and the cost of the missions right. And I, th I mean, the lesson may be we got too far in cost reduction and, uh, and accepted a few too many risks. The question might be how cheap is cheap. Yeah. Um, Mr. Uh, Sarsfield, human error, human mis miscalculation, are these just the breaks or is this something that you can expect in a mission like this? Uh, to some extent, yes, but I, I think there's a fundamental uh, uh, lack of resources that uh, John was alluding to. We've cut these programs far too deeply, and we're introducing risk. It, it's not what's failing is not the technology on these missions. It's uh, there are design errors, operator errors, uh, management errors, uh, and I think they fairly. Uh, it's a very clear indication that we're just operating these programs in uh, you know, far too leanly. Uh, and we're asking NASA, we have to remember, we're asking NASA to do an awful lot. We're asking an agency on a lean and flat budget to, to build a space station, to safely operate the space shuttle, and to maintain U.S. leadership in, uh, in aeronautics and space. Uh, Na that's a pretty tall order. But NASA doesn't seem to be complaining. Instead, they say, listen, we're just doing more with less. You don't think that's true? Uh, no, I think they certainly have uh, moved in that direction. I, th I, I applaud faster, better, cheaper practices. but. Uh, I also think, you know, if you look at the statistics, we're losing one out of three. Uh, I think that's too high. I think we can do better. Ms. Garver, a chance to respond. I think NASA feels that, that that's too high as well, and we definitely need to look into the root causes of these. We're looking at developing an infrastructure on Mars where we might have more uh, communications and navigation so that when you send missions, you're better able to manage the program. Uh, for the cheaper, better, faster philosophy, cheaper is really uh, an independent variable. Better and faster are the drivers. And uh, there is certainly the possibility that we have not, um, we have been trying to do too much with too little. Mr. Logston, if you had a chance, which you do now, to ask uh, NASA a question about what the decisions that lead to missions such as these or the outcome of missions like these, what question would you ask Ms. Garver? Well, I think the, the, the fundamental issue is, is what your Christmas wish would be for the next year's budget. Uh, my own view is that NASA, as Liam said, is, is being asked to do too much for too little. Now, Lori can't say as a member of the administration that it would be nice for NASA to have a billion or two billion dollars a year more. Uh, but uh, if you did, what would you, uh, if, if OMB and the president were that generous, what would you do with some extra resources? Well, I think it's quite clear that one of the things we would do would be to reduce the cost of space transportation to and from low Earth orbit. If we were able to reduce that cost, these kinds of missions could happen more often. It's something that NASA has been trying to do for years, and uh, we really need to invest some more money in that. 
Uh, the human spaceflight program is incredibly important to us. All of these robotic spacecraft missions are really all about precursors to sending humans back to the moon and to Mars. And I think there's a robust program. NASA is willing to give back to the taxpayer and to give the taxpayer the best value. But if they see that we need more to uh, make these programs successful, I think their dollar would be well spent at NASA. Mr. Sarsfield, the same opportunity to ask Ms. Garber a question. Well, uh, one of my concerns, uh, I'd like Laura to respond to it, is how, um, uh, how can NASA ask the contractor community, it's done this many times, to build some of these very exotic spacecraft, uh, uh, cutting edge spacecraft, on really fixed price budgets. Uh, uh, from my perspective, the uh, commercial sector, the private sector that builds these uh, spacecraft, uh, is being asked really to, to develop a spacecraft the way you or I would buy a car. Uh, and there's so much that's unknown up front. Uh, and when we attempt to do that, uh, it seems to me that we introduce a lot of unnecessary risk. So I'd ask uh, Lori how she uh, would take a look at reforming some of the procurements on these programs to lower the risk. That's one of the questions we will absolutely address in our review. We've been moving towards, as has the whole government, performance-based contracting, trying to motivate contractors uh, to work within the budgets. I think that's an area that needs further development. NASA has been on the cutting edge of trying to get fixed base cost contracting, and uh, we may need to look at other incentives to provide commercial um, companies who work with NASA the ability to have some more flexibility. You're Na you are uh, NASA's liaison to the uh, REGO, the, the what, I, Reinventing, uh, government. Reinventing Government Initiative. Um, and some people point to that kind of initiative as part of the problem that maybe uh, the cost cutting, which was so prized in this administration, has resulted in bad decisions being made for expensive projects. Well, again, NASA's cost cutting is really driven by uh, our plans to do things in a more streamlined way with less people, get rid of the bureaucracy. That's what REGO and reinventing government is all about. A dependent variable of that would be that things will cost less. Um, we have been in a situation of a restrained, constrained budget environment, which has caused us to have to do both at once. That's probably the problem. I don't think you can blame reinventing government. That's something that we've all um, seen a lot of successes over. You look at many of our NASA missions, Lunar Prospector for less than $65 million. The uh, Department of Defense did a Clementine mission to the moon for $50 million. Those are all parts of reinventing government that you wouldn't want to constrain. But when the budgets decline too much, we may have to relook at just how much we can do within those dollars. Mr. Logston, we may never know why this mission was lost. This is one of the great mysteries of this whole thing. We're used to be able to find black boxes and saying this is why. So how do you begin to come up with a cure for a disease when you don't even have a diagnosis? Well, this is one mission. I think the problem goes deeper. And, and NASA announced today that it's really going to go take two or three steps back and do a, a sweeping review both internally and externally of, of how it's going about its planetary program. And, and I think that's more important than pinpointing the cause of this specific uh, failure. Uh, the, the one troublesome part is that, that the 2001 lander, the next uh, mission scheduled to land on Mars, is basically the same design. So it, it would really be nice to know what happened so that if a, there was a technical problem, we could fix it. And, well, that's and, a big question, which is you do have landers scheduled for 2001 and 2003. When exactly do you... How do you stop and reevaluate when you don't know what you're reevaluating? Well, right now, NASA has decided we will stop while we reevaluate. And we um, are looking over the next couple weeks to see if we can find more about the loss of the spacecraft in this mission. Um, there is a possibility that we will reconsider launching in April of 01, the 2001 Mars mission. Um, if we cannot find out that there was a problem, uh, here that won't be um, a problem on a future mission, I would think we will reconsider it. One of the good things about Better, fe Faster, Cheaper is you can really um, quite quickly infuse new technologies and we can uh, do that on future missions given uh, a couple of years. Mr. Sharsfield, if, if NASA has to re-examine what they've been doing on this mission or others or just generally their whole mission, should they be reconsidering whether to explore Mars at all? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I think Mars is a critical element of the overall program. I, I would encourage NASA, though, if they're going to review faster, better, cheaper as a as a as a engineering practice and what that really means, it shouldn't just be the uh, planetary program. It should be the, all of the NASA program. In fact, 
NASA's not really building too many spacecraft other than small spacecraft these days. And uh, uh, the deep space missions are one kind of mission, but there's also been failure on Earth missions and astrophysics missions. It needs to be a, a sweeping reexamination. I'd also say that the pace of science uh, uh, needs to be very carefully evaluated. Uh, we live in a world now where we measure things. It's, it's, it's a metrics-driven government. Uh, and uh, there's a danger of NASA being driven by the metric. You know, wh what is determining the pace of Mars exploration? Is it the true will of the science community? Or do, do, does NASA have to maintain this pace uh, based on its uh, desire and need to respond to the metrics and the measurements of government? Mr. Loxon, let's, let's pick up on that point and talk about trade-offs. Uh, is there a trade-off that to be made if a s manned shuttle mission costs less, costs l more than a, mi a mission to Mars? It seems to me that somehow there's a trade-off here, that maybe they are saving money in the way that they should. Well, NASA's being asked to do a lot of different things. I mean, it's being asked to build a complex international space station along with 16 partner countries. It's being asked to use the shuttle to fix the Hubble telescope next week, we all have, and, and use it for transportation to, to the station. It's being asked to advance new technology for launch and conduct a program of space and earth science. I think we're, and, and the country seems to want all of that done. Uh, uh, there doesn't seem any willingness any place uh, that I hear uh, to sh stop any of those things. Uh, some are critical to the future, some are today's program. So uh, y you're asking to make trades against uh, some uncertain criteria. Uh, there are different figures of merit, different values in all of those enterprises, and we seem to want NASA to do them all. So given that briefly, Mr. Sarsfield, what do you think is the future of exploration in Mars, to Mars? I think it's very bright. I think we need to pause uh, to study, lick our wounds a little bit, uh, hopefully plus up some of these programs, add a little bit of resources back, because I'm convinced that most of the errors have occurred simply because people are moving too fast. And Ms. So Garver, the same, excuse, excuse me, Ms. Garver, the same question to you. NASA has a lot of plans. We will uh, take a breath here, look at our future, and we plan to be back with a robust program. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.